Good morning. It is such a joy to welcome you to worship on this third Sunday of Easter in Asheboro, North Carolina, the campuses of First United Methodist, St. Luke United Methodist, and Lydia's Place. As we prepare for worship this morning, I inv invite you to set aside those things that are distracting you and take a deep breath in. Breathe in the Holy Spirit of God. Breathe out all those things that have separated you from God this week. And let's prepare to worship together the risen Christ. We have been so blessed with our Duke Divinity student pastor, Julia Crone, for the past, uh, since last summer. She's been with us for a year for a summer placement and an academic year placement. And today, J Pastor Julia will be bringing the message, and we are so grateful for her and her faithfulness among us, and we pray God's blessing on her as she continues to serve the Lord in ministry as she serves the church. Good morning. From the bottom of my heart, I want to thank each and every one of you for the opportunity to serve here at First UMC Asheboro, Lydia's Place, and St. Luke over the past almost a full year. I have had a wonderful time learning and serving here and getting to know you. I'm so grateful for this time that we've had together and I will carry you with me always.
Please join me in affirming our faith as found in the Old and New Testaments. We believe in God, who lights the dawn to chase away the darkness, who rolls away each stone of doubt, who surprises us with incredible gifts of family and friends, silence and laughter, who raises us from sadness and despair to the possibilities of blessing and joy. We believe in Jesus, friend of the poor and searcher for the lost, who comes to us in our grief and longing, calls us by name, and sends us on the paths of peace to speak of an awesome love that is not overcome by death. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the hidden partner, the gentle messenger of God, who fills our every breath with blessing, who guides us in the dark, beckons us to do good, speaks to us in dreams and visions, and watches over us with tender compassion. We believe in the church, an instrument of God in this present moment, striving for justice, celebrating in joy, clawing at despair, living in hope, praying for healing, and forever proclaiming good news of God's persistent and redeeming love. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from Psalm 4. Answer me when I call, O God of my right. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, you people, shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. When you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, Oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and wine abound. I will both lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, first kids. So I have a question for you. Do you enjoy puzzles? I love puzzles. I especially love word puzzles and word jumbles. It's when all the letters of a word are mixed up and it's hard to guess what the word is. Sometimes I get confused and I can't figure out the word. And sometimes it's like my mind is cleared and the word jumps right out at me. Well, I have a word that I want you to guess. The letters are not jumbled up, but it might be hard to see. See if you can guess it. Can you figure out the word? That's right, it's Jesus. The Bible tells us that Jesus appeared to some of his disciples and said, Peace be with you. The disciples were afraid and weren't sure what they were seeing. They thought they were seeing a ghost. Seeing that they were afraid, Jesus said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do you have doubts? Look at my hands and my feet. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones like I have. 
Jesus could see that they still weren't convinced, so he asked them, Do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of fish, and he ate it as they watched. Jesus opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. Luke chapter 24 verses 45 through 47 says, Then he opened their mind so that they might understand the scriptures. And he said to them, For so it is written, and so it was necessary, for the Christ to suffer and to rise up from the dead on the third day and in his name for repentance and the remission of sins to be preached among all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Just as Jesus opened the minds of his disciples, let us pray that he opens our hearts and our minds so that we can share the good news with everyone that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again so that we could have forgiveness of our sins. Let's pray. Dear God, help us to open our minds to understand your word and open our hearts so that we may share it with the world. Amen. See you guys soon. It is always a holy privilege when the people of God come together to pray. And so I invite you into a time of prayer now. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, creator of all that is good and right and just in our world, we are glad for the time and the space to sing our praises to the resurrected Christ today. Continue to call us into your world as your Easter people full of the joy of the resurrection. Like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, we often find ourselves despondent, doubtful, or despairing. Help us to see beyond the darkness in our own lives, to see the hope of resurrection in all things. We pray for your holy and universal church today. We pray for our brothers and sisters everywhere in the world who claim the name of Christ and seek to follow him faithfully until your kingdom comes in all its fullness. May we work together with you, seeking out those in our communities who need to know the power of your love and grace. We pray for those places where the church gathers in sorrow or fear today. We pray for those places where ordinary people are disillusioned with greed and injustice. We pray for those who blame the poor and the weak. And we pray that at all times we will be your people who are generous with our resources, our concern, and our time. We pray for those in our community and in our world who are at their wits end, those who are angry and frightened those who believe that violence can bring about peace and for those who cannot see their way out of the darkness and are considering taking their own lives we lift up those who need mental health care and we pray for more mental health resources for all we pray for those places where there are small hopes begging to be kept alive where there are programs of compassion which needs support, and where there are beginnings of faith requiring recognition and encouragement. Divine Healer, we pray for those in our congregation who have been ill, for those who are facing difficult diagnoses, for those who are in the hospital, for our shut-ins, those in nursing homes and hospice. Be a source of healing and peace for each of these. We pray that this Easter season will continue to be a time when all of us will see the risen Christ in our world and in one another. For it is in the name of the one who was, who is, and who is to come, Jesus Christ our Lord. And we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As holy and forgiven, set aside by God to be people of generosity, I invite you now to give of your tithes and your offerings.
reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 36 through 48. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself, touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Risen Christ, I pray that you would speak to us now. God, would you please use me to speak this message to your children? Lord, may the words of my heart and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When tragedy happens, we get together and we eat dinner. It's the most reliable thing. After a loved one dies, the casseroles start coming in. When my grandpa died, a team of families from his church brought my family multiple meals a day in a seemingly unending parade. Salads, breads, casseroles, cakes, you name it. I'd never seen so many Tupperware in one place. But even with all of that food in front of us, we didn't feel so much like eating. We did do a lot of sitting around the table, though. There were arrangements to be made, people to call, thank you notes to write, accounts to be settled. And there were memories we wanted to share. And even if our stomachs couldn't handle more than a few bites at a time of Mrs. Miller's famous lasagna or Miss Betty's key lime pie, we needed the comfort that comes from being together, sitting at the same table where Grandpa used to preside over Christmas dinner. Eating together was a way to feel like things were normal again. When tragedy happens, we get together and we eat dinner. So I bet the scene wasn't too different in Jerusalem on the evening of the day that we now call Easter. After all, the greatest tragedy imaginable had just happened. I bet the disciples who were all gathered in that room were picking at their broiled fish and bread. No one's talking much because let's face it, there aren't any words for this. For three years, they had walked beside Jesus. They had come from all different walks of life. There was Simon, the freedom fighter, Matthew, who had gotten rich swindling his own people, Peter and Andrew, the fishermen. There were wealthy women who had financially supported this ragtag movement, lepers who had been healed. All of them had this in common. When they met Jesus, everything changed. There was something about him, a look in his eyes, the healing power in his hands, the way he taught with authority, something you just couldn't leave behind. Instead, they left everything else behind just to follow him. They thought he just might be the Messiah, the one they were waiting for, the one who was promised, 
the one who would overthrow Rome and set everything right and announce God's kingdom coming with fire and triumph. But a few nights ago, it all went wrong. They should have known when Jesus got serious halfway through dinner on Thursday. They brushed off all of that talk about broken bodies and blood as a side effect of the wine. They tried to ignore the sinking suspicion that Jesus' words, do this in remembrance of me, sounded a lot like goodbye. But when they woke up from their sleep, they watched as their friend, their rabbi, was arrested. The same people who had seen Jesus in the streets tens of times suddenly had clubs and ropes and swords to take him away. And they were being led by Judas, Jesus' friend, one of them. He had been at dinner with them all just that night. It all happened so fast. They didn't do anything to stop it. They couldn't have done anything to stop it. Right? The 11 remaining apostles scattered. They put as much distance as they could between themselves and Jesus, the convict. They were savvy enough to realize that being associated with him right now could mean a cross for them too. And how could they be expected to die for this man who wouldn't even stop himself from being arrested? If he were really the Messiah they wanted him to be, he would have freed himself. Their hopes were dashed. Their friend was dead. The movement was, too. Just hours ago, their world was filled with excitement and promise. They were part of this revolutionary rabbi's inner circle. Now they were nothing more than the sorry chumps who had the wool pulled over their eyes by a charismatic leader. With nothing else to do, they drudged back to, to their Jerusalem hangout, tails between their legs. And there they sit, the stench of disappointment and broiled fish hanging thick in the air. Their tense bodies jerk up in panic when they hear the door swing open. Is it the Pharisees? Are they here to arrest us too? But it's just Cleopas and his friend. And they look like they've seen a ghost. In fact, that's exactly what they think has happened. They bellow out, the Lord has risen indeed. He appeared to Peter too. Jesus isn't dead. He's alive and we saw him. The room starts to buzz with confusion and excitement. Could it be true? Could Jesus really be alive? But some of the people in the room are more hesitant. As Cleopas tells the story, it sounds like they didn't even recognize this man at first. So someone says, well, how do you know it was him? Cleopas says Jesus was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The cynics in the room are not having it. That's their evidence. Breaking bread is a very ordinary thing to do. Clearly, this must all be a misunderstanding. Cleopas and his friend were tired and hungry and hot and disappointed. The stranger did something that reminded them of Jesus, and then they remembered what Peter had said happened earlier this morning, and suddenly their brains have convinced them that Jesus was in front of them. Case closed. But others are still filled with anticipation and tentative joy. Oh, please, could it be true? And in the midst of this chaos, Jesus himself walks in. This entrance is very different from the one made on the journey to Emmaus with Cleopas earlier in the day. This time, Jesus isn't veiled. There can be no doubt about the identity of the man before them. In fact, he's so essentially Jesus 
that when the disciples try to harmonize the fact that Jesus died and was buried and yet stands in front of them all, the only thing they can think is that he must be a spirit. It's miraculous, but it's also ordinary. It's miraculous because it's ordinary. The risen Lord stands before the astonished disciples not as a spirit, but as their rabbi. He shows them his hands, rough and strong from a lifetime as a carpenter. They're the same hands that he used to heal that blind man to raise that little girl from the dead, to feed that group of 5,000 men, to break and bless wine and bread that night. Hands calloused by love lived out in ordinary life. But now those hands, those same hands, have a new feature. Rust-rimmed nail holes in the wrists. He shows them his feet, the same feet that walked the dry desert land with them for three years, the same feet that supported him as he walked across the Sea of Galilee, the same feet that Peter asked to wash just a few nights before, the same smelly, grimy, calloused feet that seemed more fitting to belong to a shepherd than to a savior. And yet, here he stands, their friend, their rabbi, their God. The disciples are driven to worship, to kiss those feet. They disbelieved for joy and marveled. But Jesus interrupts their wonder with a request. Have you anything here to eat? Like I said, when tragedy happens, we get together and we eat dinner, but usually not like this. I mean, can you imagine if when my family was grieving, grandpa had waltzed in and asked for a helping of lasagna? The dead do not normally attend their own wakes. Yet here is Jesus, dead and buried for three days, asking for a snack. So they give him a leftover piece of the fish they had been eating. Even after defeating death, Jesus is still full of surprises. So now Jesus reveals the greatest truths and mysteries of the universe in between bites of broiled fish. Not with great fanfare, angelic voices, bright lights, fireworks, but with a mouthful of salty trout. It's miraculous, but it's also ordinary. It's miraculous because it's ordinary. It turns out that Jesus is the answer to questions we weren't even asking. He is the completely unexpected solution to a problem we couldn't name before he rose from the grave. All of those things they didn't understand suddenly make sense in light of Jesus. The cross wasn't an accident. It was the climax of the cosmic rescue mission envisioned from before the dawn of time. Jesus' death was not a sign of defeat, but the way to free the world from death's grasp. Jesus' presence here with his disciples in his resurrected body is proof that God has won. His victory over death is proclaimed in his body's ability to chew and swallow fish. Jesus has been through hell and back, literally, and it could not stop his love. Death can do nothing more. Friends, the resurrection is more than just a nice idea to celebrate with candy-colored eggs. 
everything hangs on this. If Jesus is not alive, death ultimately wins. If Jesus is not alive, then as Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, we are most to be pitied. Simply put, if Jesus is not alive, we have no hope. But if Jesus is alive, then that is all we need. If Jesus is alive, then God has won. If Jesus is there eating fish with his friends, then the strife is o'er and the battle is won. If Jesus has a body we can touch and hold and cling to, there is hope for our bodies too. There is hope for my grandpa. There is hope for the more than 500,000 people lost to COVID-19. There is hope for Dante Wright and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. There is hope for the world. There is hope for you. Because if Jesus is alive, then death has been defeated. If Jesus is alive, then there is nothing in all of creation that can separate us from the love of God. And Jesus is alive.
Now may the spirit of the living God, made known to us most fully in the resurrected Jesus, go before you to show you the way. Go behind you to push you into places you might not go on your own. Go above you to watch over you and protect you. Go beneath you to lift you up when you cannot stand. Go beside you to be your companion and dwell within you to remind you every day that you are not alone and that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. Go in peace.